All right, hey guys, Marcus here. It's a beautiful day for music. It's a wonderful day for sound. In today's example here, I have a little bit of cruising. This basic show is about taking a Sunday drive, chilling out with your friends, going out with your family, pushing the limits of your car, just having fun on a weekend. So this song coming from my client, um, I arranged the wind parts and the percussion parts for this. Um, for this one particular tune because they wanted to be very specific leading into their percussion feature. Um, so what they gave me was the idea that they wanted to play this song Cruising um, or Cruising by uh, Smokey Robinson. Um, if you haven't heard that song, maybe pause the video and go check it out. Um, it's probably good to, to sort of know what the song sounds like before you kind of dive into this, or at least the original song uh, and things. Uh, they have a, a a pretty good trombone player. So they definitely wanted to feature the trombone player in the beginning with this and then find a way to transition it into this moment of, all right, we've been cruising, we've been hanging out, now let's take this to some back country road and let's push the let's push the pedal and, and really see what this car can do. We want to go fast, we want to have some fun, let's do this. So that's the general idea that they sort of gave me with those parameters. Definitely do that song at the beginning featuring trombone and then whatever else happens at the end is what happens is up to you. So um, I had those parameters. My instrumentation for this is synthesizer. So they're, they do amplify their front ensemble, which is always a consideration with how I, with how I write. They have a bell player um, that's separate from the xylophone. Um, a lot of times I'll have to ask the people if they're sort of doubling up um, if their bell player is also doing maybe other auxiliary things is in the vicinity of them or if they're just playing bells. Um, a lot of times the bell player and the xylophone player will sort of be a combined kind of position and they'll kind of go back and forth. So it really just depends. For these guys, the bell player and the xylophone player are separate. There's two vibraphone players who are both um, very new, apparently, um, to band in general. So they're just learning how to read notes and things. So that was a consideration when I was writing for them. Um, their marimbas were um, okay. There's two of them. There's a drum set player um, who was also sort of new to the game. Um, and then they had four snare drums. I believe there are two or three tenors and I think five bass drums here. So let's just start off by um, listening to the arrangement and then we'll sort of uh, move along here. Let's go for a ride. If everything's in control, you're not going fast enough.
pass. Cool. So just a few different considerations um, here right from the beginning. Um, originally, this intro, because of the previous uh, because of the previous piece that they played on the field um, was just going to be synthesizer, but because they figured out a way during Bandcamp to have the tubas in there, which is a, a better timbre, at least what I would think, um, than, than just having a synthesizer um, do the part, um, they added the actual tubas in here, which is awesome. The rest of the, the rest of the instruments are actually picking up their horns and things from a previous, I guess, body sort of idea. This kind of gets me to my first point um, with the actual vibraphones. Now, um, since they're new, I wanted to keep the parts very similar. So when they're rehearsing with each other, um, they can be using the same words and they can kind of help each other out. Now, that's not what I would consider to be the best thing for, um, for the way that I want the thickness of the chords to sound. A lot of times I would split up into different inversions or I would play the same chord, but just a slightly different version from player to player. So the vibraphone two would be voicing this chord, same chord, which is just an E flat major chord. They would be voicing this chord in a slightly different way. And this person would have just a different inversion, a, slier, a slightly higher version of that same chord. It just makes it sound fuller. It makes it sound thicker and more sort of lush. Now, from an education standpoint, because these two people potentially would have to kind of go off and have a little sectional on their own, and they're maybe a little bit new, I would prefer for both of them to have the same part so that they can help each other out and kind of communicate with each other. And it's like, oh, what was that chord again? It's like, oh, it's this. And they kind of show each other and help each other. If they continuously have different parts, it would be a little bit of a strain, especially for newer players. So it's not the best situation from a sonic standpoint, but it's definitely something that I have to consider with my clients when I'm writing their parts. Now, notice that's not necessarily happening within the, the marimba parts here. So they do have a slightly different voicing of what's going on. Um, this particular marimba player here um, is coming off of something a little bit different. So they don't, they're not going to get here in time to take this pickup. So that's why they don't come in until here. And they have a very closed version of the chords that they're playing. Um, as opposed to the sort of open fifth and third sound that's happening in, in the first marimba. That's a very, very common sound as far as having a fifth in the bottom playing one five and then playing some version of either the first and the third of the chord, or maybe the fifth and the and the first of the chord, or sometimes whatever uh, other variation of that. So just splitting it up, it makes it sound a little bit more full, and it makes it um, it makes the texture not necessarily thicker. It just supports the chord structure a lot better when we do that. What's happening in the drum set part here is just a basic ride cymbal. Now. As a person who likes to play drum set, as a person who plays drum set um, a pretty good bit for money, <laughs> I wouldn't like to see a part like this, right? Um, it's just quarter notes, it's just on the ride cymbal. Now, their drum set player isn't you know, somebody who could slam. It wasn't like somebody who's been playing for years, who's already awesome. But this is when I have to let the music speak for itself. Um, and say, cool, what does this part need right now? This part just needs somebody on the drum set playing a ride cymbal. That's just a nice open spectrum type of sound as opposed to let me play some cool stuff because it's cool on top of this trombone solo. So don't be afraid to write very simple textures, very simple things, especially if it's not the focus, because right now the actual focus is on the, the the actual trombone soloist, right? Now, I did add a little bit of a of a little flourish, a little interlude in here um, within the higher pitch mallet instrument. So it's the bell, the bell player, and then the xylophone player. How did I come up with this? This ba da di da dum da 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 dum. 
I don't I just sung it on top of the chord structure. So a lot of times what I'll end up doing is um I'll I'll be playing kind of the I'll kind of vamp or play over and over the basic chord structure. In this case, it's um E flat. And then I go to F minor, which is just the two chord in the key of E flat. I have A flat. And then I go back to E flat. Da 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 Right. So I'll I'll mess around with the chords. I'm not a pianist. I'm not a singer, but I'll kind of vamp through it and just sing different ideas on top of it. So when I'm thinking about coming up with some counter lines, some counter melodies, some ornamentation, all of the stuff that I want to be doing within some of my front ensemble parts, I can kind of reverse engineer. It's like, oh, what was that that I sung? And I'll kind of like pick it out within the chord structure, right? I know which notes I'm going to be choosing from because I know I'm in the key or the land of E flat here. So that's how I sort of came up with that business. Um, I was a little bit specific and I'm surprised because this is kind of a pre-production version of this. <clears throat> I've, I was specific about the type of mallets that I wanted here. So I wanted these to be a, an a, aluminum mallets, right? To probably have a little bit more articulation, a little bit more brightness to the sound of the bells. And then I wanted these to be medium mallets here. Most likely, hmm, I would have dropped this down an octave on the actual xylophone. Um, I'm not sure if I did that in the final version, but just for me, looking at this right now, I prefer that voicing to have the little bit of that sheen in the in, in the actual glockenspiel or the bell voice, but then to, to provide a little bit of that, the backing or depth of sound, it still has articulation because it's in the in the vibraphone, I mean, in the xylophone, but for that to be a little bit lower um, in pitch class, actually to, to support a little bit more thickness to the sound there. Um, if it's as written right here, um, for me, sometimes the texture just becomes a little bit too thin unless I want it to sound sort of ethereal and, and high sort of pitched, right? Moving along here. So when I have this next section, and by the way, with, within this particular chord structure, you'll notice that um, I do give them a little bit of an opportunity to sort of spread their mallets. I'm not keeping everything in closed position here within the vibraphone part. So they do start off on a chord that's in closed position, but then when I say closed position, the notes appear as like the root position chord, E, G, B, with just the octave on the top there, right? Now, they keep that same progression twice through. There's no real need for me to change it up on the second one. When we have this next part here, um, everybody goes to octaves. Now for me, this is kind of a rule. If I'm playing sort of a single line type of thing and it's not super quick, I will always choose to play it with both mallets instead of one. So if I have something like this, right? I'm always going to choose to play it in octaves, right? The reason I do that is, is you don't, you have, you know, maybe five or six keyboards in most groups um, and things more or less, but either way, they're having to compete with a whole band of people, even if they are might you just want to make sure that the depth of sound is always there so anytime i can play octaves or anytime i can have them add harmony or whatever with two mallets or four i will end up doing that just to have it to sound nice and thick so that's what's happening here at this particular moment i'll play it for you
sometimes I get stuck. So at least that's the intro part. Even when the drum set part gets a little bit more involved here, notice that it's not anything too crazy. Um, the first time we have some splashes here, the psh, 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 that business. Um, this is an actual, uh, the, the snare drum here um, in between these two notes. Sometimes I will um, slightly change, especially in the final version of this, how this looks, just so the person can have a little bit of a key maybe even a, a separate piece of paper on their specific um, part here, just to kind of show them where some of the instruments are placed will really kind of help them out. Mallets here have this basic kind of permutation, and that's why it's kind of written like this. But um, just to add a little bit of movement towards the end of this phrase here before this uh, cadenza-like part um, or this solo kind of moment for, for the trombone on those triplets there, very basic permutation, once again, just on um, within the actual chord structure of, of the actual piece. Now, pushing into this next moment, I would say the most important things for me, especially for this type of group, um, is the boom. <laughs> and what I mean by the boom is how they build and push into that very first hit. Um, for this for this push, right? So I definitely know I want a a bass drum sound, right? And at least at this moment, the xylophone player is playing is playing the bass drum. Notice that there's no full time sort of auxiliary people. There's a drum set player, but that kick drum doesn't go like it doesn't spread out. the The length of the kick drum is more a kind of a punchy sound, more so than an explosion sound. So I want that bass drum here, definitely, the bell player is moving to actual like hand crash cymbals. So crash cymbals in the hand, preferably something nice and big. The actual um, synthesizer player is going into a straight up sine wave. So notice before now, they've been playing, you know, some pads with some of the nice slow attack stuff that's... Um, nice and smooth and let me kind of switch to a sound just to kind of show you what i'm talking about this is just just happens to be um logic right here um right now i'm on a basic piano sound um the the piano library that i really like is called nori piano if i can get it to open here maybe not um it's called nori piano but what i mean by playing a basic sine wave is like the most basic, um, non-interesting sound just to support, uh, just to support what's happening underneath. For me, um, the easiest way I can get to a basic sine wave sound is just to load up uh, this particular thing. It's just called the EXS24. It's like a sampling thing. But if you don't load any samples into here, you get you get um, just a, a very basic and, and straight sort of sound. If I do want to change the sound a little bit, um, I can go into the envelope and move uh, move the attack up or have the attack a little bit slower. So it's not as punchy in the beginning, or I can have it go really smooth. And the same thing, by the way, I can have it go out really smooth. Yeah, so I can really um, mess around with some of those. Now, on most synthesizers, especially ones that you can really kind of dive into your settings, you can just load up a very basic patch and get to that type of sound. The reason I like it is that it just has a little bit of a support for that low brass, especially if they're holding out chords and things, which is what's kind of happening here um, underneath all of that. I don't want to take away from I don't want to take away from the tonality of what's happening with some of the other instruments here. So some of these other sounds I would prefer to have a little bit of character to it. But then when I get here, I just need basic kind of straight up bass and things. Within my other instruments, as far as my vibraphones, once again, both of these guys are, are playing 
um, the same part for that particular reason that I described um, at first. So they're switching to harder mallets um, after this whole note. <clears throat> and then they're playing these crashes, preferably, um, yeah, just together, right? They're, it's not split up. Now I did split them up with what's happening with the marimba. So notice in between both of them, is crash and two, crash three and four, and crash and two, crash three. So they're kind of going back and forth. Vibes, marimbas, uh, 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 marimbas on uh, um, vibes. Uh, uh. And that's what they're kind of doing for pretty much that whole um, chorus sort of sh uh, shout section. The reason I made that choice is if I put them on melodic parts, you're probably really not going to hear them. I mean, it'll be it'll make them feel good if they had a bunch of notes there. But in actuality, with all of these people, because their, their band is a, a fairly decent size, especially the brass players. So um, with these guys playing this type of material where they're holding out a bunch of stuff, there's a lot of um, a lot of loud kind of blocked off playing. There's just not going to be a whole lot of room for this sort of ornamentation to make it to the top of the box. Maybe if you were standing right in front of them, cool, but it wouldn't be putting them in a situation to where they can contribute to the overall sound if I wrote a whole lot of like eighth notes or 16th notes or stuff like that. Um, they'll just be doing it for the sake of doing it and things. So in order for them to contribute to the sound, um, they're better used for something like just straight up cymbal crashes and things. Um, so that's how I kind of think about that. Within the battery parts, I'm not going to get too too in depth into this right now. Some of these stickings are wrong. But notice um, it, it looks fast, but since the tempo is so slow, <laughs> it's not like this stuff isn't as fast as what it looks, the, the 30 second notes and things. Just making sure that I don't add too much counterpoint when it comes to rhythm, right? I know um, a lot of times we'll speak of counterpoint as uh, opposing lines, right? Like that kind of stuff, like as far as moving in and out of different intervals, but there's also rhythmic counterpoint. And what I'm trying to do here is treat the battery as like one unit of sound, right? So sure, there's a little bit of, of some times where people kind of have these little flourishes kind of poking out, um, like with some of the tenor parts here happening, but I don't want to, to add too much rhythmic complexity to the actual picture here. So let's listen to um, the actual battery when they come in. I'm gonna solo them up here. I'm gonna go to my score manager. You can do this either in the mixer or in the score manager. And I'm gonna start them right here just so you can hear them by themselves. So you'll notice there's a little bit of some some cute things in there as far as having the tenors um, with their Spock drums doing this business stuff. While the snares have this that kind of thing. Having them split up um, in this next measure where their paradiddle diddles are. So the snare drums going and then the tenor's having the accent a little bit after that. So they kind of, it sounds like it goes back and forth. Yeah. Bass drums just have very simple parts that can go along with that. Right? In the same way that you would um, think about playing like uh, that part sort of on drum set, right? Um, as far as those triplets 
um, very common combination to get to an end of a phrase. Boom, boom, beam, pocket tip, boom, 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 Yeah. So just thinking about it and, and some of those terms, not trying to make it too complicated and things. Notice that I'm dropping completely out of the tenor voice here just by, by sheer um, dropping whole sets of instruments will make it a lot quieter. So that's what's happening here. Punching it on a downbeat of one, they still have a unison in the bass drum voice, but then immediately dropping it down. Um, so even if the performers don't perform it um, uh, correctly or <laughs> if they have problems with their dynamic control, it's going to get quieter just by not having as many people playing, right? So that's what helps me out here. And then adding them in right at the very end, just to have a little bit of that push. Being very specific with the kind of cymbals that I hear um, for this, uh, for the actual uh, drum set part is very specific for me also. And things have a cymbal part here. Very, very nice. Now, um, when it comes to allowing space, right? So I know that we have this, once again, kind of a, a cadenza-like moment, a free form um, moment here. This person, I, what I advise them to do is have them just play that out of time. Now I had to write it specifically here just to give them a little bit of an, an example of pacing and things. But for the most part, um, that person can really take their time with, with that with this idea, dee dum, da, woo, and then a new tempo kind of starts and things. With that, I want to provide a few different things. This is how I kind of think about it. So, number one, I'm going to try silence first. I want I want to let that person have their moment right? If, if we do not think that's enough, I have a few different options. I can go for the chordal option, right? So I can look and see like, okay, well, where, where are we trying to go as far as, um, uh, as far as notes are concerned here? So maybe I can, you know, hold out like a basic um, five chord or something like that. And then um, when they get to the last note, um, play, you know, like some sort of one chord. Um, it really just depends. Um, and, I, and if I did do that, it would be just maybe within the synthesizer voice on something that's nice and smooth. I wouldn't do it on that sort of just basic sine wave bass kind of sound and things. And I would really tuck it under just enough for, the, for him to have a little bit of support there. I could go the atmospheric route, right? So um, maybe uh, some sort of non-tonal or non-pitched atmospheric sounds, right? A lot of times that can be anything from some wind, some actual kind of Foley stuff going out, recording some ambiences. Um, it can be I'm sure you've heard the 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 stock like we're gonna have some birds chirping in in the woods kind of things, but different variations of that I can have behind this particular moment. Um, I can have acoustic ambient moments, right? So having maybe some sizzle cymbals, some different forms of like if I had timpani or something like that, have that person have a little bit of a role, maybe a little bit of a, a bass drum in the background. Um, some some bowed vibraphones um, on some like first and fifth of the chord. It could be a lot of those kinds of ideas. But for here, um, I really wanted to have negative space to allow this person to poke through before we give way to the next texture of the piece. Um, a lot of times that's a conversation you're going to have to have with the design team or whoever's helping you design the show, the actual band director or whatever. And it's good to bring up the different types of possibilities, especially if you don't know where, what they're thinking that moment should be, right? Because you don't want to step on their toes as far as developing an elaborate 
uh, an, an elaborate world of sounds and textures and they really just want it to be that one person or maybe it's opposite for them. Um, you really want to give them that space and you want to let that person shine, but then they really feel like that person needs to have a little bit of support and some atmosphere, either harmonically or non-harmonically underneath them. So that's the type of stuff that I think about. And that's the kind of things I would have to have a conversation with the actual uh, director. After that, I'm just playing some basic uh, one fives kind of going up to um, in that moment. And that gets me in this next moment. All right, hey guys, Mark is here. It's a beautiful day for music. It's a wonderful day for sound. Jumping right into kind of part two, getting right into the drum break business. Let's do it. So just to kind of refresh our memory here, um, this is kind of the second half. I got done with cruising um, with the trombone solo made it through the transitional elements. And let's just kind of check out some of the, the drum parts here to begin with. And we'll kind of jump into some of the stuff here. Cool. So let's just kind of unpack this section here for a little bit, just so we can kind of get a little uh, a little bit in depth. We are <clears throat> technically in the key of F, or at least that's what the, the key signature would say, right? Here. Technically, we're in D minor um, because the pitch center is around D and, and the low brass immediately comes in the baritones and tubas having this sort of uh, 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 and all of that is centered around D as if D is is the tonic D is one and things if I want to assign like Nashville kind of number system to it or um, so with that then I'm gonna get into how I came up with this little kind of rhythmic ostinato happening here on top of it. Now, most of the time when stuff like that is playing the bum, 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 I'll just start straight up on one and just try a few different rhythmic ideas, right? So while that's happening, oh. I might try something like that. So let's let's kind of hear it again with me just sort of doing different rhythms just on D here on top of it. So a lot of times I'll start kind of at that sort of place, just messing around with one note, seeing what kind of feel good, what, what feels good on top of it that has a melodic value, but also is very rhythmic in nature. My next thing that I'm gonna do, and this is probably um, very similar to a lot of people, is I'm gonna start to either sing different kind of riffs or play different um, kind of little melodic sort of phrases on top of it. For me, what tends to work is messing around with uh, the pentatonic scale on top of whatever the thing is. So if I'm in a key of D, I would mess around with those particular notes. If you don't know what the pentatonic scale is, just go check it out, um, both in major and in minor keys and things. So I would sort of look at that. What I ended up here kind of settling on are, are these three notes, right? So I have, <clears throat> I have G, I have F, and then I go down to, uh, down to D. And that just kind of repeats. My bad, as far as playing that and things. So that um, just pretty much happens over and over. And you notice that I've kind of um, layered vibraphone one in because this person had a suspended cymbal roll, 
going into here, right? The bells are on this kind of tambourine. So they kind of have after the first two measures of that entrance. So you have low brass for two measures, adding on the melodics <clears throat> for two measures as far as the front ensemble. And then tambourine comes in, just stacking and adding on different sort of colors. The drum set part is just on a nice tight hi-hat <clears throat> with a little bit of a rim knock, just, just right in the pocket. Once again, it's not the most complicated thing, but we're, we're just building little bits and pieces that all add up to an overall um, soundscape, an overall environment of sound, which is what we're really trying to do here. My tenors um, come in with this zoom. Just nice and small. Once again, just not being afraid to really um, sit back and let that groove. Almost very reminiscent to a bongo part um, and things. Now, they do have a little bit of some spice. Bass drums coming in here at the end just to kind of reinforce the low brass part. Do, 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 do. Da, 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 da. Yeah. And then the tenors have a nice little lick here. Those are just some um, outside scrapes. Yeah. So going in and out. Nice little lick for them. Um, it's, it's cute. Now, with the melodic parts here, as far as within the marimbas, I have G, B, D, B. Yeah. And I, I sort of envisioned that as just being, just keeping um, keeping the, the left hand on the B, but then just kind of going back and forth, <clears throat> just creating a little bit of a different type of movement um, for this next section here, um, which is where the snare drum back beat comes in with the actual drum set. Notice that I have them on the china. You're going to probably see and really start to notice, especially when I get to some of the later parts, I very rarely will have a backbeat represented as rim shots in two different places. So what I mean by that is if I have the drum set playing very prominent rim shots and they're mic'd. Now, I don't always stick to this if, if the drum set is not mic'd, but in this case, the drum set was heavily mic'd. So I wouldn't have the drum set playing rim shots along with the snare line playing rim shots behind them. That is just my preference. Um, I've seen it work plenty of times, but it's just, I don't like hearing both of those timbres at the same time. I definitely want one specific person having their rim shot sound. And then if it happens to be another um, flavor of snare drum underneath that, so be it. But um, so a lot of times I won't have this kind of, that sort of thing. Notice the, the marching snare drums have the rim shot. And then my drum set part is just doing two and four on a China cymbal here. With that rim shot there, kind of backbeat thing happening with my snare drums, notice that I'm very specifically just not writing them like, I'm not doing that. I'm trying to add a little bit of syncopation, that that business. I'm pretty sure that last flam in that, in that first measure there is like a, a, a flam tap. So, uh, flam tap, mm. just so I can get back over um, after this. It's probably a, a flamma diddle before I get back to that rim shot um, in, in that next measure. Once again, just providing different rhythmic opportunities and different skill set opportunities for them to kind of show. If the group couldn't really play flams that well, or maybe if they couldn't play rolls, technically none of that is necessary. You could get away with just doing that sort of idea. But being that they can do a little bit more, it just adds once again to the flavor of the little ornamentations that we can put my tenors have a nice little counter melody sort of around it. So, boom, two, de boom, boom, oh, pa da 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 yeah? And all that's doing with the beat is just adding a little bit of depth within it. I can do that, or at least I feel comfortable here doing that, is because most of, I say most, 
all of the rhythms present at the moment are all based on 16th note um, sort of grid here. And as long as I'm staying within that and I'm not trying to play like triplets or like fivelets or sevenlets or anything like that, on top of it, um, it'll, it'll translate a lot better. I also feel a little bit more comfortable having a little bit of that sort of counterpoint between the snare drums and, and tenors just because I'm allowing a lot of space within the bass drum voice for, for those two things to kind of play off of one another without the bass drum getting in the way. So let's play that a little bit just kind of by itself and things. Um, I remember when I first started writing, I would very regularly <laughs> just write too many layers and, and the layers worked in my head, but, and they even worked um, alone, like with just a battery if you're in the parking lot and you're, and you're warming up or something. But when you got the people on the field and you started adding the front ensemble and you started adding the rest of the wind parts, it just, it got too muddy and it got a little bit unreadable. Um, and people would, would be like, hey, what is that? What is that thing right there? And you would have to have multiple reads and somebody explaining it to you for you to kind of understand exactly what was going on. A lot of high schools especially do not get that chance. They might have a panel of judges that they'll kind of see once and that's the only read that they'll get. So it's not that you can't take chances. You can take chances. It just has to be um, chances that are readable and in a texture that's readable. So right now isn't necessarily the time to do that. So let's check out this part. Yeah, cool. And then I have this sort of, um, to me, It almost feels like a, a five pattern, but it's in the construct of four. So one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, that kind of thing. But that's happening um, within this measure here. Boom. Boom. One, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, paco, paco, bo, bo, boom. Right? Happening right in this particular measure. The reason I'll do stuff like that. Number one, it just makes it more funky, right? And for situations where I have a backbeat and I'm looking to kind of mix it up a little bit, my first choice a lot of times will be to go into some sort of accent pattern that's an odd grouping. So maybe an accent pattern that's based off of three or five or seven or maybe nine or something like that. What it does for me is it allows for me to... Um, immediately have something that stays away from just some 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 of the downbeats the pack pack pop pop pack pop pop you know the big big pop boom pop pop this is it's too many downbeat sort of accents and it gets a little bit monotonous especially when we've had a whole lot of downbeats within the backbeat section so i'm very specific with um trying to mix it up in odd groupings within even time signatures and things you'll probably notice that as you see um, a lot more of my writing. What's happening here is I'm going from D minor into D major. It's just a little bit of an elevation for me. It's like a, an eyebrow razor. Um, so I've been hanging out in D minor, which is the relative key of F major, but then I'm ending this little this little part here, just a little bit of a fresh air. And all I really have to do with that is throw that little F sharp in there. So instead of me getting this sort of sound, I'm getting this sort of sound. I'm, I'm getting that, that type of thing. Um, technically, I could have put a C sharp there to make it fully that kind of, um, that sort of uh, D sound. But I don't know, for whatever reason I didn't, and I just like the way this, this sound coming, coming out of there. Um, I would have to put myself back in that, in that mindset of, of why I did that and things. So that's that particular section. What's happening here, and you probably heard it in the sound design, um, I'm, I think I ended up changing it. Um, 
but uh, there's this sort of um, pitch bend thing that's just kind of winding up. It's just and it's kind of slowly building as the snare drums start nice and low. Pop, 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 pop. So it's, it, it has this idea of it getting faster, even though the BPM is very um, stagnant, it's solid, it stays there. Because of the accent pattern um, and the way that pitch bend happens, it sounds like it's getting faster. At the same time, um, I'm pretty sure there's some there's some vocals kind of going on here kind of setting up this next section of the, you know, let's go faster kind of business. For this, once again, I kind of went back and forth on how thick the texture should be. And if I know that there's going to be vocals, if I know that there's going to be sound design, I don't want everything to be unreadable, right? So I definitely wanted the idea of something rhythmically speeding up. And I even think originally I had it within the front ensemble but it was probably something in order for it to be melodically interesting, a little bit too much coming out of some of the melodic stuff that they already had here. Um, they're not super new, but at the same time, I didn't want to give them too much um, demand all in one sort of area uh, with minimal accompaniment. So that's why I decided to put it in the snare drum voice, um, have them do some interesting little stick trick type things. And a lot of times I'll just send a video of that. So I'm pretty sure it's probably what I did in this moment here, right? I just sent them a video of when the little stick flippy flippies happen or some of their sequential things of maybe like a ripple or how they're gonna come in and, and stuff like that. But for the most part, everything else is absolutely blank. So it's just snare drums and then that one trigger as far as some sound design and, and that little bit of a voice on top of it. Coming out of that, this melody is just completely made up. I don't know um, where it came from, but um, you know, the, this is what it is. <laughs> I wish I could give you more information on that and things. Um, I make up melodies a lot. Um, I've practiced making making up songs and making up melodies since I was a kid. Like we used to play little games and this could maybe be something to kind of help you as a little bit of a, a mental and creative exercise. When you're riding down the road and you see something like Arby's, just go ahead and and, and try to make up a little song or some sort of freestyle or, or something, um, a melody that has that name in there. Maybe try to incorporate um, maybe something about the building, something about their menu um, possibly sing through the menu, um, incorporate some of the stuff that happened in the commercials, maybe, if you remember some of those things. So that's how I keep my brain fresh as far as always trying to make up new melodies and always trying to really come up with new uh, rhythmic ideas. So when it's time for me to sort of pull one out of nowhere, it kind of happens a little bit quick for me, um, just because I've practiced it for so long. Um, on top of that, get yourself just used to listening to, to new music and, and finding out with the people who you already like what their creative process is, right? So for the artists that I like, I um, try to find all of the interviews and maybe try to find like them in their own studio or them, you know, talking to other um, artists and things about how they go through their creative process. Because it really helps me sometimes to say like, oh, these are some of the exercises they do to keep their brains fresh and, and stuff like that. So this melody just came from nowhere uh, and things. That snare drum part just gives way to sort of just the tenors, right? Um, the tenors have the the kind of moving part here, the bucket the bucket the bucket the bucket the bop, bucket the bucket the bucket the bucket the bop. And you'll notice that that is very reminiscent um, to the rhythm that these guys had here. I definitely wanted to have something that tied the two sections together. So that's why I have um, the tenors on this little spot drum playing that part. Ticket the ticket the ticket the ticket the ta, ticket the ticket the ticket the ticket the ta, ticket the ticket ticket the ticket the ta. And then everybody else, as far as the drum set, has this chomp dum dum chomp dum dum chomp dum chomp dum dum chomp dum dum chomp dum and once again, that's nice and mic'd, so it's, it's, uh, it has a lot of sort of low-end presence. And that's going to continue throughout this sort of phrase. We're pretty much just setting up 
what I call the classic three here or the classic four. I have a snare drum thing. There's going to be some sort of tenor thing, not necessarily in this order. And then for me, a lot of times there's going to be uh, some sort of bass drum thing. And I'll incorporate that within my front ensemble thing. It's just my preference. Um, unless a bass line is, is very strong and they can pull out some very interesting things, a lot of times I'm going to have their kind of exposed moment or feature happening with another section, right? So in this case, it allows for them to have negative space on the field because that other section isn't on the field with them. That other section is the front ensemble. So it'll seem like bass drums with front ensemble accompaniment if that's kind of how you're looking at it. If you happen to be like a front ensemble type person, you're going to be looking at the front ensemble and saying, oh, nice little bass drum accompaniment in the back or whatever. So very simple things. I definitely wanted them to be able to achieve this um, very easily. And then taking just a little bit of a chance here at the end with, um, with my one, two splits going on there. And while that's happening, the snares and tenors come back in here. Now, maybe at another time, I'll talk a little bit about how I come up with, <clears throat> with my individual licks. It might take a little bit too long here if I were to try to explain that. So basically here, I know I wanted it to be um, four measures. So I wanted it to be kind of one phrase. Keep it nice and simple for the drill writers, nice and simple for, um, for the listeners to kind of catch on to see what's happening. I like <clears throat> hmm. The easiest way for me to describe this is I knew from the beginning that I wanted some back sticking stuff in there. I didn't necessarily need the lick to be like really choppy. I wanted it to groove. I wanted it to connect with their particular audience. Um, and we had talked about some of these things when they hired me. Um, so I knew I wanted some back sticking stuff in there. So at, for at least this part in the beginning here, um, like those are two back sticks and then these come over and then this is like a pancake. So that kind of stuff is happening within this particular lick. What informs me of how I write my licks <clears throat> is going to be a few things. Thing number one, I, I hesitate to call it research. Um, this has been my life. Like it's just been a part of who I am and what I do and what I watch for fun. I wake up and I watch, you know, percussion videos, percussion ensemble and drum set and drum core and orchestral percussion. I just watch those things. So I'm very familiar with a, a large amount of work throughout the years that people have done. And I'm still very interested now. Like I still watch the new stuff. I will see what people are doing. I'll go through and learn people's licks on tenors, on snare drum. It would be a little bit more difficult for me to learn the licks on bass drum or something like that. But I definitely go through and I'll try to see what they're doing in relation to um, what's being written in other places, right? Um, I have before just checked out some people's like melodic parts and I've just, you know, figured some of them out just to see how their hands are moving or if it's maybe some sort of uh, texture or some kind of permutation that I haven't thought about to incorporate within my own writing. Um, those are the things that inform me as to the things that I like in my particular way that I like to season my food, right? Um, yeah, I guess that's what I kind of have to say about that. The way that you can learn if you want to, my language is just to check out a lot of my music. Um, I can give you some of the languages that I've learned, and I do consider them to be languages or taste, right? I am a huge fan of Paul Rennick's taste. I'm a huge fan of Mike McIntosh. I'm a huge fan of Shane Gwaltney. I'm a huge fan of Eric Johnson. I'm a huge fan of uh, Tom Unkst. I'm a huge fan of Larvey. I'm a huge fan of uh, Jackson. Uh, both Mike and Ike. <laughs> I'm a huge fan of the West Coast guys um, uh, in Gom and Mapes. Um, there, so there's a, there's a lot of people that I've studied their stuff 
throughout all of the years. Um, I'm a huge fan of, of David and, and, and Skojo over at Blue Devils. So all of that is just kind of swimming around in my head. And I'm sure subconsciously I'm taking little bits and pieces when I'm writing from, from different textures, right? I might like the way uh, like some sort of triplet flows into a 16th note thing. And I might take that from, um, from Paul Rennick. And then subconsciously, I might like the way, um, you know, some sort of accent pattern will go into some sort of random five-lit thing or something like that. And I might take that from somebody like uh, Brett Kuhn or something. But um, it's just a, a larger Rolodex of people that I've studied and I continue to study um, that informs me of how I like to write my licks and how the things kind of flow through. Same thing for um, tenor stuff. Um, I taught a bunch of years at Atlanta Quest, and a lot of times with those tenor guys, they would go out and march places on like Blue Coats and Glassman when they were around and Spirit and all of these other kind of drum corps. And I would be sure to ask them when they came back to show me some new stuff, like show me the way that their hands moved, show me what was very normal in their drum book, um, what kind of figures that the person liked to write. And, and I would take that stuff and kind of watch them play it. And I wouldn't necessarily be able to like, you know, play a lick with them then, but I would go and mess with some of the ideas of how they did their crossovers or how they phrased a certain parts. Then I'll go and watch the videos and see how they fit that in with other voices within the battery percussion and within the, um, within the front ensemble percussion. So that's what informs me of all of that stuff. Just constantly asking questions and constantly um, just, uh, feeding my creative spirit to keep pushing forward, right? This end part here is based off of this set. <clears throat> it's based off of this set of accents. Now, I came up with the accent stuff uh, first. This bump, ba ba bump, digga 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 dump, bump bump, bump bump. I came up with that sort of thing first. And then what I did is uh, I went through and started just kind of writing a little bit of ornamentation that leads into these hits. So notice I definitely wanted a triplet on this beat four right here. Um, and even if originally that wasn't a triplet, let's say that was an eighth note, but when I wrote or started to write like maybe my snare drum part or the bass drums or something, I, I figured like, oh, that feels really good to to go back to triplets or something like that. Um, I probably kind of reverse engineered it and just maybe went back and kept the same notes, but then just changed this rhythm so that there could be a certain amount of um, vertical alignment, right? And what I mean by vertical alignment, it just lines up on the page, like top to bottom. Um, you're not going to see me a lot of times unless it's for a very specific rhythmic reason or textural reason where I want to create sort of dissonance. You're not going to see me do a lot of writing like a triplet and because it just, you know, feels good in the hands to write like a 16th note roll here. Um, for me, that I just don't like the way it sounds unless I specifically am looking for a very sort of clashing and, and dissonant sort of rhythmic texture. So for the most part, I'm going to be lining these things up, especially when it comes to heavy beats and whatnot. Notice also that the idea of having an odd grouping within an even um, time signature is coming back here. So I have this idea of triple lit, triple lit, ta 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 ta, triple lit, triple lit, ta 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 ta, and that kind of goes over the bar line. So for me, it kind of shades it here, and I'm using. The, the tenors to kind of help me punch some of that. Ticka da ticka da baga daga, ticka da ticka da baga daga, there. And then both of them have the boom paga paga, while the basses have put da 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 dom, right? Back to some triplets here um, in that next measure. Once again, shading where that bar line is. This paradiddle diddle here starts on the upbeat. And I'm not putting any strong emphasis on this downbeat, so this beat one here. So 
right? It goes over the bar line as far as that figure. It just sounds much more um, sophisticated for me to do that. And that's just me. It doesn't mean that it's wrong if other people play a lot of kind of beat to beat or downbeat to downbeat kind of figures. But for me, um, that's at least what I'm thinking when I'm writing stuff like this. And then of course, just ending on something that they can definitely slam and feel really good about. So coming out of that, paradiddle diddle, just two really big counts of just straight up 16th notes. Ba -ba 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 boom, boom. And then there's a vocal that happens in this measure. In the recording, you only hear it with me saying it, but um, they ended up doing it with the whole band, which I kind of suggest it because I just think that really sounds very powerful and whatnot. And then they have the very last note. So let's go back here and we're going to listen to the whole thing to kind of wrap this up. And if, if I have any more um, comments, I'll try to remember those as we kind of go along here. Go for a ride. If everything's in control, you're not going fast enough. Awesome. So yeah, so that that concludes this particular piece. Hopefully this has been um, a little bit of, of uh, useful for you. If you like what's happening here on this page, um, definitely give me a thumbs up. Definitely subscribe to the page and go check me out on, on Patreon. I'll see you guys in the next video. Deuce.